Indeed, God alone. There is no God like our God. No one can possibly take the place of our God. And this morning we say thank you. Thank you that we have a God like you, O oh God. One that we could not live without. To try and live a life without you would be hopeless. It's a life that we don't want to live. It is important to us that you are in our lives every moment of every day. And we say thank you. Thank you. We thank you for bringing us here this morning. We thank you that you are a God who wants to speak to your people. And as the words leave my mouth today, may they be the words that you have given to me and not words that have come out of my head. And just pray that they will reach the people you want them to reach. Each one of us will hear something different. Pray that each one of us might learn from that this morning. That we might each one leave here having been so blessed. And may it bring glory to you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Welcome to this morning's family service. We welcome all who will be watching online. In August, for the whole of August, the pastor ministered on victory. And this year, it's God's grace, God's glory. It's for the glory of God this year. And if we are to bring glory to God this year, we need to live in victory. And that is the theme that I want to pursue this morning, victory. It is important that we live victorious Christian lives. And we're going to look at a certain passage or a certain person this morning, someone in Scripture who knew how to live in victory. And we want to follow the example of that particular person. And if we do, then we will have the victory that he had. And we're going to look at that great king, Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat is one of my favorite characters in scripture. And Jehoshaphat knew how to live in victory and achieve victory in his life. So we're going to begin, we're going to take the word victory, and we're going to go through letter by letter. First of all, we're going to look um, at the fact, with the V, that he valued the book of the law. He valued the book of the law. Now, our readings this morning, we're going to read as we go along. I don't want to do one reading at the beginning. I want us to follow through. And we're going to start with um, 2 Chronicles chapter 17, verse 4, and then 7 to 9. I see we've got plenty of readers this morning. <laughs> I won't have to do any. Verse 4, please. But sought the God of his father and walked in his commandments and not according to the acts of Israel. And then 7 to 9. Also, in the third year of his reign, he sent his leaders, ben Hail, Obadiah, Zechariah, Nethanel, and Micaiah, to teach in the cities of Judah. And with them he sent Levites, Shemaiah, Nethaniah, Zebediah, Asahel, Shemiramoth, Jehonathan, 
Adonijah, Tobijah, and Tobadonijah, the Levites, and with them Elishama and Jehoram, the priests. So they taught in Judah, and had the book of the law of the Lord with them. They went throughout all the cities of Judah and taught the people. He valued the book of the law, and that was, that was how he was able to gain victory. He valued the law so much that he sent his officials to teach it in the towns of Judah, and they took the book of the law with them. Just think what an undertaking that was, to go and teach in every um, town in Judah. But he did it because he valued the law. He not only realized the value of abiding by the book of the law for himself, but all the people needed to know it as well. It's not enough for the pastors to know. We all need to know it. We need to know if they're leading us into error for a start, which we're sure they're not, of course. But we need to know it for ourselves as well. It's not just sufficient for the pastor and the leaders to know it. And in this case, uh, it had far-reaching effects. It made such an impact that the fear of the Lord fell on all, all the kingdoms of the lands that surrounded Judah so that they did not make war with Jehoshaphat. How wonderful was that? They all taught, they all knew what was right and they knew what was wrong. And the people around them were so afraid now of these Israelites that they didn't make war with Jehoshaphat. It had such far-reaching effects. And what we do in Dover Court can have far-reaching effects throughout our country and further afield to other nations. Isaiah 55 and verse 11, please. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. If God wants someone to get a message, they'll get it. If someone in here this morning, God has got something he wants to say to you, he'll get it, you'll get it, because his word does not return back to him void. It accomplishes what he pleases. And he knows where that word is going. He knows what he wants to achieve. And he will achieve it through that word. What does 2 Timothy 2 9 say? Can you take that picture of me off there, please? <laughs> 2 Timothy 2 9. For which I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even to the point of chains. But the word of God is not chained. The word of God is not chained. It's free to go wherever the Holy Spirit sends it. And it will accomplish what God wants it to accomplish. Just think of the impact it would have if every town in Great Britain had teaching about the word of God and accepted what it said. Everything could be turned around, and it certainly needs to be turned around today. Just think what a great difference it would make if the word of God was taught as part of a school curriculum. That's what we need. We need teaching in the schools, we need teaching. In some churches don't even get the proper teaching. We need to be taught the word of God. And it can have far-reaching effects. We are very privileged in this country to possess Bibles when so many persecuted countries do not have them. Let's make use of them. Let's learn what it says. And then this town, this country can be turned around. So he valued the book of the law. 
but he identified problems and he dealt with them. Chapter 17 of 2 Chronicles, please, verse 6. Verse 6. And his heart took delight in the ways of the Lord. Moreover, he removed the high places and wooden images from Judah. He took action. He knew there was a problem, and he dealt with it. He removed all those high places and the Asherah poles from Judah. The people then were worshipping the Baals, and they weren't worshipping God. And so Jehoshaphat did something about it. He did something about putting the situation right. So how did he do it? He did it by using the book of the law, teaching people how they should live to please God. So in this country, we need to get back to the word of God. And until we do, things will go from bad to worse. How much worse can they get when you read the newspapers every day and you hear and watch the television? Everything is just going worse from one day to the next. You can't walk peacefully down the road now without getting shot. So many things are wrong. People are worshipping idols rather than God. And so things need to be put right. And the only way is to put God in his rightful place. That's the only way things will be turned around. Put God in his rightful place. And so as individuals, we need to identify the things in our lives that are wrong and put them right so that we can live the holy life that God requires for us. Psalm 51 and verse 10. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Create in me a clean heart, O God. We need to get ourselves right with God. And then for the sea, he centered his life on God. Can we read um, verses 3 and 4 of chapter 17, please? Now the Lord was with Jehoshaphat, because he walked in the former ways of his father David. He did not seek the Baals, but sought the God of his father, and walked in his commandments, and not according to the acts of Israel. The Lord was with Jehoshaphat, because he walked in the ways that David had followed. He did not consult the Baals, as everybody else around him was doing. But he sought God, the God of his fathers. In verse 6 of that chapter tells us that his heart was devoted to the ways of the Lord and he removed the high places and the Asherah poles from Judah. So I ask you the question, are our lives centered around God or are our hearts devoted to to the ways of the world? Do we have rival thrones in our hearts? Let us put God in his rightful place. The psalmist in 86 verse 11, please. Psalm 86, 11. Teach me your way, O Lord. I will walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. In the verse that I read, it said, Give me an undivided heart. An undivided heart. God wants the whole of our heart. There'd be no other thrones in our heart that I might fear your name. And then Deuteronomy 10, 12 and 13, please. Uh, 
And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways and to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command you today for your good? With all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, with all our strength, our lives are to be devoted totally to God. And it says that he's given this commandment for their own good, and it's for our own good as God's people, that our lives should be centred around God. And that is how we get victory. That was how Jehoshaphat got victory. Then, for tea, he took his problems to God. Now we're going to go to chapter 20 now, please, and verse 12. Now, if the city will not make peace with you, but makes war against you. So, no, so I beg your pardon. Chronicles, we're in Chronicles. <laughs> 2 Chronicles 20, sorry. O oh, our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power against this multitude that is coming against us. Nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. It wasn't all plain sailing for Jehoshaphat because he heard that a vast army was coming to make war on him. And when he heard this, he resolved, says he resolved to inquire of the Lord. Wise man. He didn't attempt to work it out for himself. It was too big a problem. So he took it to God. No problem is too big for God. Sometimes we make the mistake, don't we, of trying to sort out big problems for ourselves, and we can't. We need to take them to God. And that's what Jehoshaphat did. He knew he couldn't do it. He said, we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. And that's where we have to keep our eyes. We keep our eyes upon God, because he knows exactly what to do. And when we are faced with problems, do we take them to God? Because there's no one better to deal with them. Some things are too big for us to deal with, but nothing is too big for God. No matter what it is, it's not too big. The invading army was too big for Jehoshaphat, but with God, one is a majority. So he took his problems to God. He identified his problem, and he took his problem to God. And then for the O... He was open to God's answer. Can we read chapter 20, verses 14 to 18, please? Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jael, the son of Mataniah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph, in the midst of the assembly. And he said, Listen, all you of Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem, and you, King Jehoshaphat. Thus says the Lord to you, Do not be afraid nor dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow, go down against them. They will surely come up by the ascent of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the brook, before the wilderness of Jeruel. You will not need to fight in this battle. Position yourselves. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord who is with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord is with you. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem bowed before the Lord, worshipping the Lord. He was open to God's answer, and God answered his prayer. 
and he sent a message to Jehoshaphat through Jehaziel, telling him exactly what to do, and I mean exactly. He told him when to do it, in verse 16. He said, tomorrow, not today, not next week, tomorrow. He told him where the enemy would be. He said, he'll be climbing up the path by Aziz at the end of the gorge in the desert of Jeruel. He didn't have to waste time locating the enemy and wear himself out in the process. He knew exactly where the enemy would be because God told him. And then he told him what he had to do. In this case, what he had not got to do. He wouldn't have to fight. He just got to stand firm and watch God do all the work. How wonderful is that? Specific instructions which he had to adhere to. And when we take a problem to God, he will tell us how to sort it out. He will tell us what to do, when to do it, and he will help us to do it. If he hadn't stuck to those instructions that he was given, he would have, it would have turned out very different. They could all have been killed if he hadn't obeyed what God said. He was in the company of the right people to give him the right words from God. Those people who listened to God as he did, and Jehaziel was one of those people, and he used Jehaziel to tell Jehoshaphat just exactly how to get out of the situation in which he found himself. And when we come to God with our problems, let us be open to what he says, no matter how impossible it seems, not come with our ideas of how it should be done, but just do what God tells us. Sometimes you think, oh, this can't possibly be right, but God doesn't make any mistakes. Just do what he says. Obedience is the key to victory. Saul lost his throne because of disobedience. Scripture says to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. Do what God says. Stick to what he tells us. So Jehoshaphat then was ready to obey and he trusted God. And that's in 20 and verse 20, please. So they rose early in the morning and went out into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you shall be established. Believe his prophets, and you shall prosper. The message was so unusual. Go into war, but not having to fight. Just have to stand and trust God. It was like asking them to commit suicide. It took a lot of trusting. And sometimes God asked us to do things which take an awful lot of trusting. He was going up against this vast army, an army that he couldn't possibly beat by himself. It had to be a work of God. But he did trust, and he did exactly what God said. And he said to the people, have faith in the Lord your God, and you will be upheld. Don't say you might, you will be upheld. Have faith in his prophets and you will be successful. No doubt, not a case of maybe, you will. And when God says you will, it happens. Do we have that kind of faith? If we don't have it, we can ask for it. The apostles did. In Luke 17 and verse 5, please. 
And the apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith. If we don't have that kind of faith, we can ask for it. God will answer, he will give us that faith. And if we have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it will obey you. Now, how impossible does that seem? Then for why? Yesterday's problem became today's victory. Can we read um, verses 24 and 25, please? So when Judah came to a place overlooking the wilderness, they looked toward the multitude, and there were their dead bodies fallen on the earth. No one had escaped. When Jehoshaphat and his people came to take away their spoil, they found among them an abundance of valuables on the dead bodies, and precious jewelry, which they stripped off for themselves, more than they could carry away. And they were three days gathering the spoil because there was so much. <laughs> when they arrived at the place, they saw only dead bodies. They did not have to do anything. And if they hadn't trusted God and his prophet Hazael, if, <coughs> excuse me, if he hadn't done exactly what God said, it would have been a completely different story. They would have gone out to fight and they're probably all being killed. Obedience to do what God said saved their lives. Can we read Hebrews 11, 6, please? But without faith, it is impossible to please him. But he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. That trust was rewarded. There was so much plunder that it took three days to collect it. And if we stick to God's plan, victory will be assured. Then, led by Jehoshaphat, all the men of Judah and Jerusalem returned joyfully to Jerusalem, for the Lord had given them cause to rejoice over their enemies. And this year, we want to see God give us cause to rejoice over our enemy. If we trust in God and obey his leading, we will have cause to rejoice. And I'm praying that this year will be a year of victory for us as individuals and as a church collectively, that we will see victory over the enemy and things turned around in our country. When God gives us victory, we must never forget to rejoice and give him all the praise. If we want to live victorious lives, we need to value God's word to make him the center of our lives. And when we take our problems to him, let us trust him. No matter how impossible the situation seems to be, then be obedient to whatever he says. And if we follow that formula, then we will see victory just as Jehoshaphat did. So... Jehoshaphat valued the book of the law. He identified problems and dealt with them. He centered his life on God. He took his problems to God. He was open to God's answer. He was ready to obey and trust God. And then yesterday's problem became today's victory. And I'm just praying that this year we are going to be victorious Kingsway Community Church is going to be victorious this year. 
Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Loving Father, we thank you. We thank you because you give us the victory. And we pray, Lord, that this year you will help us to make you the center of our lives. Bring our problems to you and whatever you tell us to do, to do it. No questions asked. Just trust you because we know that you, the things that you say are best. You will never lead us down the wrong road. And if you say you will do it, we know you will do it. And so we pray, Lord, undertake for us this year. And in Kingsway Victorious, Kingsway Community Church, we pray that you will make us victorious, that we might go out in this town and be able to fulfill the, the theme for this year of your glory, that we can go out and bring glory to you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.